talk about Galapagos Safari Camp today, and we have the lovely founder and owner, Stephanie Bonham Carter, joining us from her home in Quito. Um, what I want to do is just kind of talk a little bit of background, uh, my connection with Stephanie and with Safari Camp, um, and then it's kind of the concept, and then we're going to take a tour of the property, talk about the excursions, and at the end, I'm going to have Stephanie talk about what they're working on right now for when tourism opens back up in Ecuador and the Galapagos, um, some kind of changes that will be happening, and just kind of her thoughts. But um, I want to start with something and make you blush, Stephanie. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's a, oh, love, no. It's a, it's a love letter. <laughs> but it's a love letter that you wrote, but I want to read it back to you because I think it's fantastic. Oh, no. Are you going to um, so you, What did I say? So you posted this the other day on Instagram. And I love your stream of conscious. And this is, I think, really typifies you and what Galapagos Safari Camp means. Um, and so I wanted to share it with everybody. So you wrote, to those of us who find ourselves pondering over the future of travel ought to maximize this time to reinvent ourselves and take a good look in the mirror. Our industry has the potential to bring about positive change, yet we have witnessed the dark side of tourism. What started as genuine interest to learn about and connect with other cultures, nature, history, very quickly became standardization and homogenization of humanity, a photo opportunity for posts. We have seen the rise of over-tourism, marketeering, commercialization, greenwashing, and buzzwords void of meaning. On our end, we have experienced the pressure to stage experiences in lieu of encouraging authentic ones, which simply are what they are. We have had complaints because there is not enough trees for shade during visits to outer islands in the Galapagos. We grew from a love affair with each other and with the Galapagos into a fragile operation trying to balance passion with business. We welcome this opportunity to go back to our roots and advocate for a more sensitive way to explore this wonderful world that we have the honor to tread on with lighter and mindful steps. Galapagos Safari Camp started as a personal dream. We have stuck to our guns, spreading the word of appropriate luxury over greenwashing, but being a very small player in an industry with loud voices, our message has been but a whisper. Perhaps now that the world has reduced its decibels, whispering might be more appreciated than screaming. How relevant will the Galapagos experience we champion be in our brave new world? Is it time to become selective and only welcome those that come with the right intention rather than solely wanting to tick boxes for bucket list destinations? Is it time to stop the price war that only saves individual tourism players to the detriment of the destination? Is Gibran, did I say that right? Gibran? As Gibran subtly put it, and I say to both my house and the road, to ha I have no past, nor have I a future. If I stay here, there is, there is a going in my staying, and if I go, there is a staying in my going. Only love and death will change all things. Are we experiencing both love and death? Is it time to change all things? Gosh, I was inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it was just fantastically written. I think it really captured you know, who you are and what you do at the Galapagos Park, what you've already stood for, and what you're doing now, I think, is going to be more relevant than ever going into this post, uh, you know, COVID travel landscape. Um, so I wanted to start with that to kind of set the tone of it. Um, and I'm going to largely present um, on this because I can, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, the background of how I got involved uh, with Galapagos Safari Camp. Um, and then we'll have Stephanie chime in with questions and some anecdotes herself personally. But I wanted to start with Stephanie, do you remember the first time we met? Oh, I'll never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably so 2000. Nervous, but it's with this big group. <laughs> <laughs> no, prior to that, in San Francisco, when you visited me, Brady yes. and I. Yes, 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 I do. So but that I was 2008. <laughs> you were nervous then. Yes. But uh, I wanted to bring this up because uh, this was probably about 2008, I would think. And you had just, when did you finish? When did you do finished the safari camp um, 2006 or 2000, well we started in 2004 when we bought the property and 2009 mm -hmm. we inaugurated yeah no, sorry, okay but i think it was 2007 yeah i think it was about 2008 you came to san francisco i was managing the latin america department of geographic expeditions and you would send an email you wanted to come in and show us your property and pitch your idea we did go off of the safari camp to us um, so I just got this email from you and I remember reading it and I have to be honest, I read it and I thought, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I was like, <laughs> why would someone go to the Galapagos and not go on a cruise ship? Exactly the same thing. 
<laughs> I was like, why would someone go to the Galapagos and not go on a cruise ship? Why would they base themselves on land? And then a tented camp, what is this all about? How do they see the wildlife? How do they see the islands? But I never said no to any vendors that wanted to come and visit. And I remember the day you arrived, I was like stressed. I had so many bookings I was dealing with and they said you were, had arrived and I was literally be like, I don't have time to meet with them, tell them to go away. But thankfully I did, we'll come out and meet you and Michael. And uh, for me, it was actually a, a life-changing meeting. Um, it was a, the inspiration for me to start the representation company. Um, cause you completely brought me back to what's important about travel. Um, and that's why I read this letter, um, that you had just written, um, as we started talking about what you were doing and the way you explained it to me. And I was like, so, you know, why this? And you were said, you just said to me, you said, well, Michael and I are not group travel people. We're not tour people. We, you know, we, we like to have our, our time and really immerse ourselves in destinations. And we wanted to plan this as kind of an African safari where people slept under cannabis and they were connected with the outside world. And they went out on like game drives during the day nautically by boat to see the wildlife but came back to this really intimate point of camp where they had space to think and really soak up this destination they came to not constantly being on the ship with a bunch of other strangers with the drone of a diesel diesel you lose a lot of the sound of the bird call and the sunrise and sunset and as you described it I was like you know what you are totally right and you know we ended up spending probably an hour and a half sitting there speaking and I just was like and you're telling the story, you know, here with your beautiful family at the time you built the, the camp and giving birth to your son uh, there in the wild in an inflatable swimming pool. I mean, I was just like, this couple is so cool. And also where you're from, because you're Ecuadorian, but you listen to your accent, very proper British accent. And Michael couldn't figure him out. He's Dutch, but he grew up in Spain, but he went to school in, at Cal Poly in California. So he's got this like Dutch, Spanish, California surfer guy, guy vibe. And I just thought you guys were fantastic. And what it told me was here, I was like, all I did was sell cruises, did millions of dollars with the cruise bookings. And I didn't really enjoy it. Um, it was so different from other things where I was crafting unique itineraries around Latin America and the Galapagos was just like, here's the date, here's the price, book it. And then speaking with you guys, I was like, you're exactly right. This is the type of travel I like doing, customized, personalized, small, crafting it. So I decided I didn't really understand your thing, but I started to offer it to clients. And all of a sudden I realized that there was a lot of people out there that were like, maybe didn't want to go to the Galapagos. They wanted to go to the Galapagos, but they wouldn't go to the Galapagos because they were not group travel people. They were not tour people. They're not cruise people. And it just kind of turned them off. They saw it as too mainstream. And then I started explaining your option of doing this. And those travelers were like, that sounds amazing. I want to do that. And so, I, and I realized those were the coolest travelers I worked with. They were the best clients. And so it totally like opened my eyes of kind of like seeing things differently and realizing and bringing me back to why I got involved in travel in the first place. Um, you know, for the love of it and connecting with people and connecting with destinations. But I had become this person that was churning out bookings on cruises and other things. Not that cruises are bad, cruises are wonderful, but it just was like, it was a business to me. And it just took me back to my roots and my passion for travel. So I just wanted to share that story with you all. And then, you know, shortly after meeting you, I started sending you clients, getting a fantastic feedback. And that's when I was like, I want to start this representation company to work with people like Michael and Stephanie and properties like this that are doing something totally different that have an impact and have meaning in travel. And so I stopped and that's why I work with the properties that I do now was the inspiration that you guys brought me that day. So, um, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm going to interrupt you just one second. Last night we watched out of Africa and mm -hmm. I, I mean, we all know this wonderful movie and it was one of the biggest inspirations. And we just remembered why we started what we started. Uh, of course, yeah tented camps we were so inspired by our african our own african experiences and the african specialists will probably relate to that it is such an intimate relationship with nature and i think anyone that's in travel the reason why we are in travel is because we just love it and we love mm -hmm. the experiences and what that provokes and how it transforms us so um yeah i just thought i'd share that because <laughs> it, it brought back all the yeah. reasons why we um, started the way we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and stick to your guns, and you're still doing what you set out to do. Yeah. Um, so um, let's go on and talk about the safari camp. Um, I'm going to try to go through this as quick as possible to then give Stephanie more time to talk and people to ask questions. But so obviously it's in the Galapagos Islands. Um, the safari camp is located on Santa Cruz Island here, kind of the central island, and this is where the majority of flights coming uh, from the mainland land on the small island of Baltra here. 
So um, flying in, you'll land, you're met by your private guide from the Galapagos Safari Camp on arrival, rather than being, you know, grouped with everybody going on a cruise ship. And then you travel up into the highlands of Santa Cruz Island. So you can see the airport here. You take a little ferry across with your guide, and then you drive up um, into the highlands. And the property is right up here. So it's actually on the very wild, what is that, the western side of the island? Um, the w very wild western side, the only kind of human habitation there is in Puerto Vallarta and these little small towns of Bella Vista. There's a small town of Santa Rosa that you go through on your way to the safari camp, but you're basically driving into just, like you say, this out of Africa wild um, setting where the property is. Um, so there's where the Galapagos safari camp is. So essentially where the property is, it's a 30 minute drive down to the water, either getting to the Itabaca, Itabaca Channel or 30 minutes driving down to Puerto Vallarta, the main town um, on the island of Santa Cruz. And those are our two kind of access points when we go do nautical excursions out to other islands. Um, you do have that drive down to the water um, from where the property is located. So um, about the property. So like I said, you're driving out into the wilderness here. You're driving through these uh, highland tortoise reserves to get to where the property is. This road is the bane of your guys' existence. <laughs> As it gets washed out every year and Michael has to bring in heavy machinery to flatten it out. But it is what it is, it's nature. Um, lovely just driving on that road often people are arriving and there's tortoises that are roaming across the road and people are freaking out oh my god there's giant tortoises and for you it's like this is a normal thing sometimes you have to wait for the tortoise to cross the road until you can get to the property i mean nature rules in the galapagos and this is a great picture that shows it um of that thing and you know when you get out to the property they have that they bought i mean the views are phenomenal looking out you know over the channel and the islands what is the island we're looking at here that's uh, uh that's santiago is that Santiago Island? And the thing is, it's like there's rare places that you go in the world where there, you can't see any other trace of human civilization. And here, basically, from periphery to periphery, there's no light at nighttime from any other dwelling. I mean, you are surrounded by the wilderness and you're looking out. You occasionally might see a ship transiting that canal, but you really are in total silence. You have the sound of the wind going through the trees here um, and this beautiful moss hanging. Um, so I'm going to kind of take you through a little bit just to show you the installations and the style of the property. So we're going to start um, here at the main lodge. So this is kind of the common area and the dining area. Um, this is the entrance. I love everything here has a story like this beautiful temple door. What was it from India? You guys were given as a wedding present. Um, that serves as kind of this entryway, this like magical doorway as you walk into this, this beautiful lounge. Um, so again, it's a very small property. So it's a small common area as well. But this is part of one of the sitting areas. There's also where this picture was taken from is another sitting area. Um, just very open, huge glass windows looking out onto that view, you know, fire in the evening. It doesn't really ever get too cold here. I mean, it gets a little bit chilly in the evening sometimes because we're up at higher elevation rather than being down at like the blistering heat um, down on the coast. Um, fantastic food. Um, Michael has a background um, in agriculture, having studied the Cal Poly. So he you know, raises cows there for beef and for milk and for cheese and you guys really source all your food as locally as you can. I mean, not much is grown in the Galapagos. Um, so you keep it very simple. Your chefs are phenomenal. Um, and so just the dining experiences here are, are, are legendary. I mean, everyone's come on fam trips. People leave notes of just like, what great, fresh, wonderful displays of food. So we've got like the main dining table if people want to dine communally, but it's also a place where you have this huge wraparound terrace so people can, you know, we ask guests, would you like to dine with other friends you made while here? Or would you like to dine just yourselves? And we can set, set tables where they want so people can have their space. Unlike, you know, this is really different from when you're being on a cruise ship. I mean, cruise ships in general, you don't find any two top tables on cruise ships. You generally find like four, six person round tables and everything's communal on cruise ships. So that's really different about the safari camp is people, you know, the bookings are all independent and separate and people have their space and their liberty and they're kind of on their own uh, timetable. It's not a group you know fixed thing um, which typifies it so getting into the lodging so it's a tented camp so there's nine tents in total they're just a short walk down from the lodge and they're each separated from one another as you can see um, in this drone photo we do have some tents that are closer to each other than others which we'll use if we have families that want tents closer together we have some tents that are much more excluded so like a honeymooners or whatever we can choose the tenting depending upon you know the profile of the clients that are coming to stay so we'll take a look inside the tents. They're all the same layout, but this beautiful glass sliding doors and the screen doors onto this patio with that view out looking over the ocean. And you know, this is what you have in the morning, just like getting up, listening to the bird call in the morning, watching the sunrise, watching the sunset from your patio, having freedom and time and space by yourself to think, you know, and kind of uh, process these amazing experiences that you're having. 
day to day in the Galapagos. Um, this is one of the tents. This you actually have a crib set up in this tent. Um, but they can be, you know, twin bedded. They can be triple bedded. They can be queen bedded. We have cribs. They all have ensuite bathrooms, 24 hour hot water, which is all solar. Um, it's also pretty amazing. Um, Michael has developed this, what is it, geomembrane, which is like a freshwater capture system because there's no freshwater in the Galapagos. Most people actually have to buy it by the truckload um, that are brought up to the property, whereas Michael has 100% um, rainwater self-sufficient um, on the land. And he's also helped a lot of other local farmers in the area develop these systems as well. Um, so again, a couple more shots of the interior of the bathrooms there. Um, let me just see, there was a, one question that came. Are the tents air conditioned? No, there's not air conditioning here. They don't really have the energy supply to do that, nor is it really necessary. Um, like I talked about, you're not down at the at sea level. It's roasting and stifling up here. What elevation you're at? Maybe 300 meters? Uh, no, 900 it's more, feet? Like, more like uh, 500. 500 so, meters, so maybe 1500 feet, yeah. So it's pretty ideal. I mean, when you're talking about the evening and the morning, it's not like no one's in their tents in the middle of the day. People are out on boats, they're out exploring, they're on bikes, they're seeing wildlife, they're out doing things during the day. So it's not like people are in the tents in the middle of the day. There it might be a little bit hot, but you know, they have great ceiling fan circulation. You know, the evenings they cool down. I mean, you're actually with a comforter at nighttime sleeping up here at night. So it's a lovely temperature. Um, you know, and air conditioning wouldn't do much in these tents either with fabric walls. So, um, so that was a bit about the tents. We also have on the property what's called the family suite, um, which is a three bedroom house. Um, this was actually Michael and Stephanie's uh, house, uh, raised their kids in when they built this and they lived here for many years before moving to, um, before moving to Quito, just because of the kids schooling. Um, but they had built this really, you know, with their kids in mind. So the layout of this is wonderful. Now it's for guests that maybe want to come and have the Galapagos Safari Camp experience but they don't want the tented experience. We have this like standalone house for them um, or even larger families, uh, multi-generational families. So you have the master bedroom here with the king bed, has the most amazing deck and view looking out. Um, so there's a couple shots of the, the master bedroom of the villa and then there's two separate um, twin bedded rooms and all the rooms are kind of interconnected. Plus they all have their own a uh, access outside to the patio. So it's a really wonderful flow. I mean, it was obviously parents did this, you know, you guys built this thinking of your children of being connected and but having access to the outdoors with it as well. So there's a patio and then downstairs you have kind of a den and play area. So wonderful for families with young children that might be worried about the tents. I mean, I've had my kids here, I think, my, the youngest, they were three years old. Billy was three. We slept in the tents because the boys were like, no, we're sleeping in the tents. And they actually slept in their own tent, an adjacent tent to Jackie and I. Um, and it was fantastic. I mean, there's no uh, poisonous or dangerous animals here in the Galapagos and nothing like that you have to worry about. Um, so, you know, the boys had their own tent. If they needed us, they could call over to us, but they loved it with their, you know, their torches or flashlights at night and having their own tent. They just thought they were kings. And you guys do a good job. If you do have younger children staying there on the tent, so you have a netting that they'll put around the patio, um, you know, to protect the safety of it. But to me, I think the feel of the safari camp, what's really amazing is sleeping in the tent. That thing of listening at night to sounds of owls outside and the wind through the trees and hearing the bird call in the morning as sun rises and having that natural light filter in it really sets you on this natural time clock so i really love the tented experience compared to sleeping in an enclosed structure and that was kind of the whole concept of the safari camp was to have people connected to this wild area um so yeah some people asking about could you fit two families in there i mean i had one master room and then two twin rooms so really it's for six people um, we do have a lot of buyouts of the camp where we have multi-generational families where maybe the grandparents will be out there with some grandkids and the rest of the family are in tent. So it just really depends on the makeup of the group, how we'll, how we'll do, the, um, do that. And then a couple other things on the property. They've got a wonderful viewpoint, which is actually the picture I'm hanging out in the viewpoint, drinking a cocktail. Um, and then there's a little um, plunge pool as well. So a couple shots of that. So that, that's a wonderful place to go and, and chill out at the end of the day. And I remember when you had David Attenborough staying here when he was filming this, I mean, He's that guy, David Attenborough, you watch his things and like how crazy this guy is about wildlife. And the thing is, even when he was there was filming, I love your stories about after a day of long filming in the Galapagos, he would come back and he would place himself in this pool and would just sit because all the birds come and use it as a bird bath. And he would just spend until nighttime looking at the birds. And the guy was like, even in his downtime, he was still David Attenborough. Look at this warbler coming to swim here. Um, and then you have the sunset viewpoint. So they do like sometimes, you know, sunrise champagne breakfast here. We do sundowners at this place and it is just an incredible spot 
um, to watch the sunset. Oh, and this is where I sleep in these little cheeky pictures that you sent me. Um, one of my favorite things visiting here at the safari camp, Michael and Stephanie have a photo album on, in the in the living room um, of their process of building this property themselves. And it is unbelievable. And you can go through that and you talk to the staff, um, you know, about it and just seeing what they went through, like coming up with this concept and, and building it themselves. You were here, you were pregnant at the time and gave birth in the middle of this construction progress, which is just unbelievable. And there's pictures of the dogs. Bigger, um, bigger, huge boobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really cool. So if you do get the Safari Camp, check out this photo album. It's unbelievable, the, the kind of story of them building this place. So that was a bit about the, you know, just the property itself. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it, like what it's like coming back there after your day out exploring the Galapagos. Um, but I'm gonna talk about how Galapagos Safari Camp operates, like how you get out and see the wildlife. What do you, what do, you do? So first I wanna say like, here's the norm in the Galapagos is you book a cruise ship um, and you're with everybody else on the cruise ship. You're always in a group of people. You have a guide for 16 people. You're with those people on the ship the entire four, you know, three, four, seven nights you're with them. And most of your wildlife experiences, you're there in those groups. Um, you know, there's set itinerary. So when you're booking people, you're looking at what are those cruise date departures? How's it going to fit in with my client's um, schedule? Um, so that's the norm. Whereas what Stephanie was setting out, Michael and Stephanie was setting out, this Galapagos Safari Camp experience was focused on kind of doing the opposite of that is they wanted to provide a more flexible and customized experience for people coming there. So it wasn't just, this is the trip, these are the dates. It's like, you know, let's work around your dates. We, do, we don't have fixed dates. We might be doing it for a little bit. We'll talk about that later as we open back up. But it's essentially, we build the trip around people's, you know, availability, how much time they want to spend in the Galapagos, what their interests are. And it's, uh, it's about as private as you can get um, considering the regulations in the park. So I'm going to kind of deep dive in that, but that was just kind of different here. Um, we have our naturalist guides, uh, probably, I don't know, half a dozen that are like the most consistent ones that work with us. And then some uh, more on top of that, you know, these are all independent freelance guides. But what I found with the safari camp is that the, the quality of the guides that you have are just phenomenal. Um, and it, it uh, they, one of the guys explained it to me and it made total sense. They said, look, I've been guiding for 10 years on the Galapagos. When I was single, you know, being out for uh, a month at a time and then having five days back at home was fine. I was constantly on the cruises working. Um, yeah, what's this guy's name? Hope remembers him. Uh, Andre. 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 Yeah, Andre. Um, so these guys, you know, at the stage of their career, they're working these cruise ships and they're gone for a really long amount of time. And then they're back home in Puerto Vallarta for a few days and then back out. Whereas these guys becoming more senior, they have families, you know, that they have children they're raising at home. And so the opportunity with Safari Camp is that they're able to come and they're working just with a couple or just with one family for, you know, five, six days, whatever their duration of stay is. They have just one, one couple or one group they're looking after and they guide during the day. They take people out. But then at the end of the day, they're able to go home and be with their children and be with their family, you know, and be more present and then come back to work the next day. So the actual, the guides, the demand to come and work at a place like the Galapagos Safari Camp is great because it allows them just to have, you know, more of a normal life. And these are some of the most senior sought after guides in the Galapagos that just prefer working in this way compared to being gone for a long time. So, you know, when you do a booking with this, we will have one guide like allocated to your client specifically, which is the, you know, the naturalist guide for them. And then, you know, the idea is getting out to have these wildlife encounters, but on a more intimate private thing where it's with the guide and with the guest going out to see the wildlife and then being able to customize their ship. Do people want to do a bit of surfing while they're in the islands? Are there already surfers and want to do some surfing in the islands? Um, are they scuba divers and want to incorporate some scuba diving into their, you know, wildlife experiences? Um, you know, we're able to, since the way we run it private and customized, uh, on like, a, you know, a group fixed itinerary like a cruise, like we're able to do these special moments, like set up these wow picnics in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a tortoise reserve and really surprise customers in it. So it's a completely different, like offering of service in the Galapagos than the norm of fixed itineraries of cruises around the Galapagos. Um, you know, and then just having people like space to reflect and to space themselves and to, to slow down. This is more about slow travel. This isn't about racing around hit every island as quickly as possible. This is about experiencing the wildlife in a genuine, authentic, private, customized way, and then having your space as well there to really appreciate where you are. 
So getting out to see the outer island, so we're based on Santa Cruz Island, and we do day yacht. And so on the island of Santa Cruz, there's like dozens of different a la carte excursions that guests can do during the day. So it's like, you know, sea kayaking down in Garapatero Beach, sea kayaking in Tortuga Bay, going into Puerto Ayora, going to the Charles Darwin Station, visiting some of the small local producing farms in the highlands to kind of see the cultural human side of, of the islands, doing scuba diving trips off of Santa Cruz, doing biking trips. There's tons to do on Santa Cruz itself. Um, but then this is interspersed with days going out on day yacht explorations of the outer uninhabited islands. So we're based on Santa Cruz and we do day yacht trips out to Bartolome, to North Seymour, to South Plaza, to Santa Fe are kind of the main day yacht trips where you'll go out during the day to go snorkel and do the walks on these islands, just as you would off of a cruise ship, but in a smaller scale. Um, and then we do have in the past arranged also like island hopping where people will go over to Isabella Island for a night or two that we'll talk about later because we, we work with other third party providers. Um, but that if people do want to spend somewhere else, like in a beachfront hotel location as part of their stay with at Safari Camp, we've arranged that in the past. So going out to these islands, um, we work with uh, various day yachts. These day yachts are generally permitted um, to take up to 16 passengers. Um, so in the past we have worked it or the way we generally work would be like we're buying space onto these day out departures for our guests and we're arranging this ahead of time for them. Um, so you're going out. Um, we can do this either with your own keeping that private guide from the safari camp going out with the guests on those day out trips or just going with the shared guide that's on the, that boat. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this at the end about how we're going to be doing this differently in kind of the post COVID landscape. Um, and then of course, ideally, with these size boats, you know, chartering from four to six to eight and up people is fantastic. You can have a completely private departure um, for yourself. And then we do have some smaller boats as well um, that are just the regulations run a bit different about what they can and can't do in terms of where they can go, what outer islands they can they can go to. But, um, you know, we, we do a lot of the just completely private day yacht charters for guests as well, which is a great example. So, it'd be, you know, I would be here for two hours. I went into every little detail and option, but just to say that the idea is that we're going to customize it, you know, to the client's budget and to their interest and availability of boats and getting them out, depending upon what month they're coming. Of course, it's like, say you're coming in May, we're definitely going to suggest make sure that people get out to like North Seymour where the blue-footed boobies are breeding. Maybe if they're coming in during a colder water time, you know, October or something going out to Bartolome where you have more of a chance to swim with penguins would be ideal. So again, we're going to customize the itinerary based off the season and the, you know, the, the likes of the people. A question we often get asked is, well, you know, doing this day out thing where you're maybe going out to three islands or something versus doing a week long cruise where you're hitting eight islands, you know, are you, you're missing out on wildlife and, you know, there's a short, and there's a long answer to that. I think the short answer to that is no. I mean, we, I think in the history of seeing every feedback form, I think I've seen one or two times where guests have said, I was a bit disappointed that I didn't see the amount of wildlife that I thought. Um, and again, that's like two people out of hundreds uh, that come to stay, if not thousands. Uh, most people are, you know, ecstatic, the wildlife is thing. And I think the reality with the Galapagos is that, you know, if you look at what are people's expectations and what are the big wild wildlife that you're going to see, it's like giant tortoises, marine and land iguanas, um, sea lions, frigate birds, blue-footed boobies. I mean, that's pretty ubiquitous wildlife around the Galapagos um, that you're going to see on the islands that we go to. Um, some are better for certain species than others, but you're going to get a good array of like the iconic wildlife that you've come to see. Um, what, what adding more island destinations and more stops to your itinerary might add is more number of species. When I'm talking number of species, it's like, say we're going to see, you know, this is a traditional land iguana on North Seymour. Well, on, um, I don't know, Espinosa, there's like the pink bellied land uh, iguana, right? Because it has a pink sheen to its belly and it's a completely different species from this on a neighboring island, which that's cool, but I think for most travelers, it's like, you know, unless they're a major biologist, they're like, oh, so it has a pink belly. Like, that's the way they look at it rather than, you know. So, yeah, you're going to rack up more subspecies, but I think that you're seeing this in a slower, you know, not frenzied pace. You're soaking it up in smaller, you know, more intimate experience, and you're going to see a fantastic array of, like, the, the key wildlife there. Um, so we do have, you know, talking about all the customization, we have what we found to be like the ideal itinerary layout. So our most popular, we start with is like the classic safari, which is a four night stay, five day, four night stay where people come, they'll have a day in the, the highlands and the highland tortoises. They'll have two days of day yacht trips out. So in this one, like day two and day four, I put North Seymour and Bartolome as an example. 
day three, they'll have an, a day to choose what they want to do on Santa Cruz or their own private guide. And then the last morning have something around the property and, and leave. Um, we cater, we have a lot of families that come that just don't want to be on cruise ships with other people. Um, so this, the family safari is fantastic. It's really the only like truly family focused itinerary I think I've seen in the Galapagos and I've done it with my kids as well. And there we're not doing as many of the long navigations out. And one of the great, one of the favorite components of this is this lifestyle fishing thing where Michael and Stephanie started working with a local fisherman in the Galapagos who do commercial fishing. And we charter their boats for the day for guests to go out with them. And um, we kind of use their fishing boats as platforms to go access really obscure snorkeling sites that the cruise ships don't go to, some bays on Santa Cruz for walks that nobody goes to. And then as you're going along, you can troll and catch like one fish that permitted like 25 pounds of fish. Um, and some people just enjoy that and they'll catch like a huge tuna and then bring it back to the camp at night and the, the chefs will prepare ceviche for the whole crowd and the family's like, yeah, we, you know, we caught dinner for everybody at the property. Um, and you get this interaction with a local fisherman who, to be honest, have almost more, if not better, um, knowledge of the marine life in the Galapagos than the university trained naturalist guys do just because they spend every day out in the water um, knowing what they're doing. So there's that. And, you know, there's at least instances, we've had a lot of instances out on those trips where they've come across pods of dolphins and people will jump in um, with their guide and swim the dolphins, which is something that would never happen off of a cruise ship because they're not going to jump 50 people out in the middle of the deep water. Um, to do that. So this, this nature of operating really opens up doors. As I talked about, we have the extension sometimes to Isabella Island that people want to go over there and to kind of maintain quality control, we'll send our guide with the clients over to do the excursions there. Um, and then we do have a small percentage of people that do cruises and then we'll come and do like extensions after a cruise for two or three nights. Um, most people think that this is a, actually been one of our main core businesses, but it's not. Um, I, this accounts for a small amount of the people, people that are doing cruises might come and spend two nights, but it's a small amount. Most people are coming to safari camp as an alternative to a cruise. They don't want to cruise. They don't want to be on a, you know, on a vessel. They want this more customized, private, flexible experience. Um, but it is an option to come and spend a couple of days after, but this is something I don't, we were talking about this yesterday that I don't think we're going to be able to offer this initially. Um, you know, when cruising gets started, when it does get started in the Galapagos again, we can't really take the risk of people that have been on a cruise ship and then having them come back to the camp where we're keeping things private and kind of really, you know, regulated to have someone coming off of a cruise ship where they've been with 50 to hundred people and introducing them to our camp environment. So we might be putting a pause on these type of extensions, uh, you know, for the time being. And Stephanie will talk more about that, you know, but a lot of people, sometimes they do the extensions and the fact where they've been on this, you know, cruise, which is, uh, you know, they're up early morning and their cruises are really exhausting. And they come and they want to spend a couple of days at the end just chilling. So they'll be at the camp and they will arrange and take them down to beaches on Santa Cruz and pack a beautiful picnic for them. And they just get a little time to like chill before they fly back home to their, their crazy life. Um, or if they want to do an extension after the cruise and do something active, they can do that. And we have all these biking and hiking and sea kayaking uh, options for them. We do have a lot of divers, though that are doing cruises, but they want to dive. There's really no cruise ships, conventional cruise ships that you can also scuba dive off of. So we do have a lot of divers that will come particularly prior to their cruise and they'll spend a couple nights um, at the safari camp and they'll scuba dive, uh, do like two days of, you know, two tank dives and do that and then board their cruise to do their traditional cruise. Um, so we, one of our guides actually owns the best, uh, the best scuba outfit on the Island called scuba guana. So we have a really close working relationship with them and they manage all the diving for our guests as well. And this is an option if you want this built in, if their people are not doing a cruise and they're staying with us multiple nights and they want to dive plus you wildlife, we mix that in in what's called like the dive safari, which is day yacht trips out to see wildlife mixed with days of, of scuba diving. And so coming back to the camp, what's really different is that you've gone out during the day and swam with sea lions and, you know, been with blue footed boobies. You have this incredible wildlife experience, but you come back to this beautiful wilderness property in the day and it's totally serene. Most of the day trips, people are leaving around between eight and 9 a.m. And then they're coming back between three to five, I'd say three to four actually. So you do have good time in the morning at the camp to take it slow. And then also in the evening, you have hours and you, you come back here, the, the sunsets up here are just phenomenal. So, you know, a dip in the pool. Um, we run a kids club there as well during like kind of spring break and summer and, and holiday times when we do have a lot of families at the property. Um, so this isn't a place that you, you come drop your kids off and you go out for the day. We don't do that. This is more like when people come back at the end of the day, the kids have something to go like kind of, you know, monitored activities. Um, they'll go like nature walks with them and do plaster casts looking at, footprints they find, um, you know, do some arts and crafts stuff with, uh, 
wildlife related. So it just gives the parents time to like go have a glass of champagne, watch the sunset, talk. I mean, that's something I've always found on these trips. It's like one of the rare times that I actually get to talk with my wife for more than 30 minutes uninterrupted due to this that they do at Safari Camp, which is wonderful. And then, you know, part of that, we'll do cooking lessons with them. We also do cooking classes with guests. Um, the, the property Michael and Stephanie have is a whole sustainability thing they have going on there. They grow cacao and produce chocolate, single origin chocolate from the Galapagos. They reforest all the local area and surrounding farms with native Scalacea trees as well. Um, so one of the really interesting excursions at the property itself is going on kind of sustainability tour, going around and seeing the water catchment systems, the solar systems, the farm aspect, the Scalacea trees, the cacao plantation, like seeing the behind the scenes working of a really sustainable operation in the Galapagos is, is really cool. This is their chocolate. Um, some of you might have received a bar of this recently. We just sent out the very first batch to some of our, our best clients. And then to me, this is it, man. End of the day, you sit there with a the cocktail, you watch the sunset, you have a chat with your family, with your significant other, mingle with others if you want to, but there's plenty of space. And like, this is so different from the end of the day when you're on a cruise ship and you're in an enclosed confined space in a dining room or a bar with a bunch of strangers. You're kind of forced to interact with everybody. Here at the safari camp, this is the end of the day. I mean, sitting there watching the sunset, you know, no marine diesel running. It's just a true, like a place to disconnect fully. Um, and so food wise, I think I already kind of talked about that. So we kind of do individual tasting meals. Um, and there's just some shots of in the evening of, you know, since families separated out to different tables as well. And we do a lot of interactive kind of cooking classes as well. Um, so that's pretty much it for my presentation. I just wanted to go back and saying like, we know, we know who our clients are. Um, and I think that's the key to selling this and putting it in front of clients. Um, so we know some of the key things about who they are is one is, we find we have a lot of travelers. They're extremely, extremely well-traveled people. They have been to everywhere, but they haven't been in the Galapagos. And you ask them, well, why haven't you done the Galapagos? Usually their answer is, well, I just doesn't interest me because it seems so mass market. So many people go there. We're not cruise and we're group tour people. And they don't know something like this exists. And once they're told that, they're like, oh, this sounds really cool. I want to do that. We have a lot of families with young children as well, just because of the thing of, you know, having a six-year-old on a cruise running up and down corridors. So the last thing I want to do. Um, People that want to spend time on mainland Ecuador, like at Zuleta, which I talked about yesterday, or Mashpee, and don't want to spend a full seven or 10 days in the Galapagos. They want to do like four days in the Galapagos and then see greater Ecuador. It's a great thing. And then we have like divers, servers, honeymooners. I mean, I can't think of anything less romantic than being on a cruise with, you know, as a honeymoon couple. And so we have a lot of honeymooners that like want to do a different honeymoon and a cool destination, but they find this and like, this is perfect. And they, some of them just have days to chill and be with each other up at the camp. Um, so yeah, it's really knowing these people. I mean, they're generally very well-traveled people. A lot of them have been on safaris in Africa and they love this concept of sleeping under canvas. Um, and they're not your normal travelers. They don't want to do things the way everybody else does it. They want to do things different and they're people that appreciate slow travel and people that appreciate connecting with the destination they've come um, to see. Uh, all right. Non-stop. So, Stephanie, I'm going to pass it over to you. I know you've been answering questions here uh, in the chat thing in the meantime, but um, you, you would kind of send me some of these bullet points you wanted to talk about, about what, you know, just talk to us about what the situation is for you as a business, what you're seeing as optimistically, what the realities are. Um, okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, Clark. I don't know how you do it. I could never do it as well as you. <laughs> <laughs> it's what I do for a living. It's what I do for a living. <laughs> well, you do it very well. Um, I think that if anyone has any specific question, we'd be, be very happy to talk about it. Everyone obviously wants to know what next. Uh, the simple answer to that is really nobody knows. Uh, in terms of uh, what's going to happen in the Galapagos, what is going to change, how, when it is going to open, we don't really know. So, um, we're taking it one day at a time. I think that there is um, basically, we ought to be looking at the positive impact that we're going to see after COVID. Um, the first thing, which is what we're hoping will happen, is that people are going to come to the Galapagos with a lot more awareness and sensi sensibility to the destination. Um, a lot of people, it became a bucket list destination. And I think that we need to, it's our responsibility to change that, to, to, to get away from the bucket list towards um, the passion of visiting a destination. Um, 
we were seeing that there was a movement towards mass tourism, not just in the Galapagos, but everywhere else in the world. And um, hopefully we'll go back a little, a decade or so when we first started, when people really came, appreciated, loved it. And it was more about quality rather than, than quantity. Um, in terms of the camp, I think it's in our DNA. The way that things we do, which is very geared towards appropriate luxury, we've never focused on mass, we've always focused on private, um, on quality. Uh, I think this is our opportunity to highlight that. There won't be any huge changes from that respect. We will continue pushing towards small and private. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions going on at the moment. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions and I can answer a couple while you read this next slide and thing it. So um, you already answered about booking, how far does it book out? I mean, as you said, holiday periods where we're booked one to two years in advance for holiday dates. Um, and then, you know, it's just pretty much, I say that our biggest booking season is when children are out of school is when families travel. So we get a lot like spring break, summertime. Um, in terms of seasonality in the Galapagos, I, I, you know, you would have to come to the Galapagos every single month and go to every single island to really see the full array of everything there is to do there. Um, really the only, the least ideal month for us is September. It's foggy in the highlands, there's cold water, the seas are rougher, and we actually close the camp generally in September to take care of doing maintenance then. Um, so I'd say that kind of September, you know, end of August, September, October is when you have more fog to colder, bit rougher seas. But with that cold water, with the current, brings actually large marine life. So there's kind of a pro and con to everything. So I would say the really only months that I would have as a red flag for people is September and letting them know that when they go out on the day trips, there's probably much more movement in the ocean. So they're prone to seasickness. They wouldn't want to, to be there. Um, Christy asked, um, are most travel agents booking director through a DMC? Look, that's up to you. Um, it's not, something I'll add to this is actually over the years now, Galapagos Safari Camp, when we run our operation in the Galapagos, we actually have a full operations office in Quito as well that handles airport transfers, hotels in Quito, booking places like Zuleta, Amazon Lodges, Mass Pre Lodge. So we actually do serve as a DMC. So if people are booking Galapagos Safari Camp and then want to have us provide all those other things, we have fantastic wholesaler rates. Actually, Safari Camp is like, I think the second largest booker of Zuleta and Mashby Lodge in terms of the DMC in Ecuador. But we don't work as a DMC. Like if you're not going to be staying at the safari camp, they, you know, the point is not to pull us in all different directions and have us doing all these itineraries that don't involve the property. So it's mostly when people, you know, are booking the property with us, then we'll take care of the stuff. But if you want to work through a DMC, you can do that. I will just add that there's not many DMCs that have firsthand knowledge of the way that we operate. So sometimes you'll find that the communication can be a little bit frustrating there, although we do have certain DMCs and I can give you a list of those that are, you know, work with us good um, but most people work directly. I mean, Christy, I know that, um, you know, Laurel has come. We've had quite a few direct bookings where they work directly with the safari camp in arranging everything um, there. And then we have some that have their preferred DMCs or tour operators here in the U.S. Um, I think it's best if you want to work, say, to say, I want to work with a U.S.-based tour operator because that's how I'm, I feel more comfortable doing that. We can let you know those U.S.-based tour operators that know our operations really well and work well with us. We can let you know. Um, same thing with the local DMCs. We can let you know if you want to work that way rather than directly through us. But, you know, that's up for you. Um, is it suitable for less active folks um, with, like, mobility issues? I mean, I think that's a thing. Even if you're on a cruiser doing this, you're in and out of vehicles, you're on and off out of boats. So no matter how you do the Galapagos and you want to be moving around, you're going to have mobility issues. Um, we do have a lot of families. Like I said, we have a lot of multi-generational families where they have, like, older grandparents and then, you know, their kids and then their grandkids that are there. And we have had where they booked out the camp and some of the grandparents just kind of chill at the camp and we'll do little excursions with them on Santa Cruz while the rest of the family is out during the day on these day out trips. So we can do that. Um, and then mosquito issues. Um, you know, there's bugs in the Galapagos, but I particularly up, if you're down on the coast, yeah, you're going to have more mosquito yeah, issues. It's not a huge issue. I mean, of course we have yeah. uh, insects, but mosquitoes is not a, a big concern. I mean, normally we would get them for a couple of weeks after the rain, and that's about it. So it's not, not a big problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you have wonderful airflow through the entire property, and I've never, I, I mean, I'm thinking of all the times I've been, I've never left there being like, oh, I got chewed up. It's never happened there. You just don't really have insects no, up there. So it's not a problem. Yeah. Um, so, Stephanie, you want to talk about this a bit, about what yeah, we're sure. planning um, in terms of reopening? Yeah, I mean, it, 
which, what direction are we going to follow? As I said at the beginning, all of us are trying to get our magic balls out. We don't really know, but we are preempting what the potential troubles might be. We have run a risk assessment to see at which points we need to fine tune our operation. Um, so we're working on that. I don't have anything um, crystal clear at the moment, but we are working on that. What I am seeing is that there, we're going to focus largely on emphasizing private groups, because of course we can do that. We're so small, you know, nine tenths. We could have like two parallel groups who can have a, a, a private experience each. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's, that's going to be our emphasis, chartering the boats as opposed to sharing boats um, and promoting the, the, the small group uh, visits. Um, the yeah. other thing that we are wanting to work on is our biggest safari has been the four-nighter or even the five-nighter. I think that, that that was very much a reflection on the speed of our world. You know, everyone wanted to fit in as much as possible and everyone was trying to, you know, go fast, fast, fast. We really want to emphasize, as I was saying, quality over quantity and small moments maybe in this quarantine the whole world has realized that it is important to slow down so maybe add a day of being quiet and relaxing at the camp which a lot of people used to say to us i wish i had that extra day so we're going to try and lengthen the stays a little bit more and then just to begin with we will try to narrow down our service providers so for example our Isabella extension, which worked very well, and it is a beautiful extension, but that means that we enhance our risk, and to begin with, we want to minimize it. So people that have worked with us might see that we're offering a little bit less, uh, just so that we can really control the, the service, the quality, the risk, and so on. So those are the three things. Of course, we're working on protocols, like everyone else is, um, but we won't publish them yet until we really know what's going on and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just going to go back to the emphasis on private groups and what that would look like. Um, so like I said, sometimes these day yacht trips in a normal world, we would have, you know, there's two couples at the camp and a family here. Um, you know, sometimes they would all go on that day yacht trip together, shared, and there might be people from some other properties on Santa Cruz also on that boat. So what we're saying is we're going to try to avoid that initially. Um, depending on how the world looks like. And so we have about four different day yachts that we work with. So what we could do is like Stephanie was saying, we might have two private groups at the property initially. So we might have a group of four. We might have a group of six or eight where, yeah, they're going to be at the property, maybe eating at different times, um, you know, when they're at safari camp. But during the day, that group's going to have a chartered private day yacht. This group's going to have a private chartered day yacht. So it's like they're going back on that day yacht, which is theirs. And there's not going to be other strangers on and off of that boat. That's going to be their private charter day yacht while they're there. So, um, yeah, that is great. So, I mean, we, we were working on pricing for this to see how to maximize, you know, how we can most efficiently offer something where it's like even a, a family of four to have a fully private charter day yacht there. But if you think about maybe two couples that want to travel together, the two families coming, you have eight people, that's ideal. You know, if you have two families that have been kind of like, quarantine together at home and they're like, let's go to the Galapagos. They can come and have like their own private day yacht and their private experience there. So that's what we're envisioning doing in terms of having these private charters there. Um, and I think you had one more thing of, yeah, just the, you've already kind of talked about this, the development of protocols working on this, but it's kind of hard to, yeah. we know what we want to do and what we can do at the property. And that's what's nice about the safari camp because obviously looking at how to operate a cruise, there's not as much flexibility in the way that they're going to be able to do things unless they retrofit the dining rooms and whatever. Um, but, you know, Ecuador has not said this is when we're opening up. They have not, the Galapagos story has not said these are some parameters that people are going to have to operate under. There's a lot of political wrangling going on. There's all this. So the thing is, we're not told right now. We, there's no direction on this is what's going to be required of you. And this is what's going to be made possible, nor have they said when's it going to open up. This is all crystal ball stuff, so it's not even worth going into. The thing that we can do now is what we have control over is the camp that we run and knowing our operations, the flexibility that we have within them, what we can do. Um, so, you know, we will have to keep you guys posted. But I'm just, for me personally, and I think that first slide, I'm really, as you said, you used to be just this whisper in a loud industry, and now I think due to this happening now all of a sudden people see this and like this is fantastic this is what people are going to want you know and that's great and it's a shame that a global pandemic it took a global pandemic to you know bring people this realization of 
you know, slowing yeah. down and, and having a more private trip. So, um, yeah. I mean, as awful as it sounds, I think it's almost one has to look for the silver linings. And I do mm-hmm. think this is a time to reevaluate everything and um, and slow down a bit. As a human race, we were going a little bit nutty, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, if anybody else, let me just see if there's any other questions that happened up here. Um, sample itineraries with pictures to share. So I'm going to send you the follow-up that I do after all of these with the recording of the webinar with like the timestamps to jump to bits. Um, and then, yes, we do have sample itineraries that you can share um, when we do have those like priced up to give you an idea of what the costing is like um, for it. Um, I'll send that in the follow-up so you have it. But again, keep in mind that the way that we normally operate might be changed coming, uh, you know, after this. Um, minimum age for kids. I mean, you don't, you don't really have an minimum age for kids. Um, no, we, we don't, but it's a very good question. Um, I mean, our kids were born there. We can cater for babies. Our entire team is used to them. It's more a question of how comfortable the parents are with the children. You know, some parents are very relaxed and they don't mind. And we've had, mm-hmm. ba- we've had many babies. Do the babies enjoy the experience or the parents? As I said, it depends on, on how relaxed the parents are. But ideally, I mean, for kids to appreciate it and have fun, I'd say from six onwards, you know, because mm-hmm. at that point they are not in need of yeah. all those naps and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. So I took my kids, I said, yeah, as young as three and six, two boys. Um, that was their, their first time there. And it was like, yeah, the six-year-old swimming with sea lions, swimming with sharks. I mean, he just was involved in everything. The three-year-old loved it. But, you know, we were still in that nap. Your life was dictated by naps. But that was what was cool is we'd be out on an excursion. We'd have some of the chartered fishing boats of the day. We'd be out. We were exploring. And then all of a sudden, three-year-old, it's time for him to conk out. And they, you know, guys would make a little bed for him on a cushion with a pillow and put a little towel over him. And we just floated in the water and we pulled up on a beach. And while he napped, we snorkeled and he just had his nap. Whereas you wouldn't be doing that in these like shared group excursions. So that's what's so wonderful as a family experience with Safari Camp is that you do have that flexibility. Maybe you're down in town, you know, like we did a day, we went down in the Port Toyota, we went and made chocolate, we went and checked out the market, all that, you know, but they were hot and it was, it was really hot, like hot sun yeah. and humid that day. And we just you told know, the guide, we're like, you know what, we want to go back to the camp early. You know, maybe we're going to do lunch at the camp rather than in town. The guide's like, cool, let's go back up. You know, we have that ability because it is in private. So. But you know, what I, you know what I would add? I mean, from the experience that I've had looking at families and observing children that have come and stayed with us, we often, people that sell the tours or parents, we all often look at it from a grown-up perspective. And when you watch children there, they have so much fun with the most basic of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, you know, Steve, who's here in this call, he sent us a family once upon a time, ages ago, one of our first families that he sent us. Um, they had the best day basically picking fruit in the orchard. That was their highlight. <laughs> they loved picking apples. And I remember this child saying to me, what do I do with a peel? And I said, well, darling, just throw it on the floor because it will rot. It's biodegradable. And, and, and that coming from a city like London, it, 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 you're not familiar with that. So all those little moments, that's why we want to incorporate the element of slow traveling because it, it is there where the magic happens when you can actually take time to observe, to take it all in and rather than this horrible rush and kids need that. Kids need that time. Mm-hmm. You know, having the artist to paint with them, just being at the camp is an amazing experience for the urban uh, visitors. Yeah. Say, I want to take this moment to plug this. So this is a beautiful thing that happened just the other day. Um, and Beth, who's actually here, these were Beth Jenkins, Beth Jenkins, the Washington's clients. Um, she's on the call. Um, she had a family, oh, the Quinn family that came in January. Amazing. Yeah, she's, Beth, Beth is here. Uh, Beth, thank you. She just sent me, I don't know if you'd be able to see this, but basically this family came and the daughter was 13, Kendall Quinn. And she self-published a book. And you can't Amazing. see this, but it's how to, get, how to get the best experience in the Galapagos Islands through the eyes of a 13-year-old self-published this book and has it on Amazon for like $7. And it's actually really, really good. Just about like seasons and how to pack. And uh, Kendall wrote the most beautiful introduction. She said, this book is dedicated to Andrea Mera, host of the Galapagos Safari Camp, as well as the entire staff. Their dedication to going above and beyond for each and every one of their guests, planning out specific schedules and showing attention to detail made our experience the best we could have had. When staying at the camp, not only were we treated like royalty, but we felt like we were a part of a new friendship. <laughs> that would make me cry, but so sweet. Um, yeah. I'm going to include the link to Amazon 
in the follow-up email. So if you guys think you've got like $7, I think just like, you know, Kendall saying her books being bought on Amazon, she'd be how stoked is she going to be to see that. And we're going to buy a bunch of these to send to, you know, clients before they arrival because it's just super cute. So, um, yeah, thanks Beth for, for that. And, you know, these are the type of guests that we have come to the camp. I mean, just really appreciative, wonderful people and, and her, you know, dedication means a lot because that's the way people are treated when they come there. It's a, it's a friendship, you know. Um, let's see, anything else? Elizabeth, uh, are you going to offer long stay specials? I mean, probably, yes, uh, hopefully. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know, it's obviously the longer you stay, like anything with our operations, our, our fixed costs get spread out over a period. So it, the costs are already lower for the longer the trip is. And it depends on what you include in it too. You know, if you're going to do a longer stay and you're going to add more and more day yacht trips, then yeah, it's more expensive. You add in a couple just days to be more flexible yeah. there. And even we can do days where they don't have anything planned initially while they're there. They say, you know what, I feel like maybe going biking today or I want to do this. We can generally arrange that, you know, like yeah. right there on the, I'd on love the, to on jump the spot. In here, Clark. I'd really like to jump in because I know that the new trend is going to be bringing prices down. I'm seeing this in the Galapagos. Uh, cruises doing $1,000, mm -hmm. $2,000 off. Listen, that is insane. That is desperation. People are going to go under like that. Um, I, I, I think that, I mean, because we're such a small operation, it's going to be very hard to compete in that arena. We're not going to enter a price war. We, we cannot, and we don't believe in that either. Um, mm -hmm. So we are going to try and price it as well as we can and make it as accessible as we can within reason. But uh, we're not going to play that game, if you see what I mean. You know, yeah, it's yeah. going to be a yeah, killer yeah. in Galapagos. And it's not who you are. It's something else I want to add as your representative. I, as I said, you guys kind of inspired me to start this thing. And you also keep me grounded because, you know, as a rep, my thing is to go out and drum up business. And so you're just in that mode often. And there's been numerous times that I've come to me like, Michael said, we've got to have this meeting with this tour operator. And they so want to book like all these dates. I want to do 12 departures with us with 14 people and book out the entire property and this, this, this. And you're like, wow, this is great. You know? And then looking into it, you come back and you're like, Clark, I really appreciate what you're doing, but we just decided we don't want to deal with this. I'm like, what? You know, and then you say, look, these, they're having unreasonable demands and expectations of what they want. And we feel like it's going to take up too much of our, you know, availability to cater to individual families and groups. This isn't really what we want to do. Yeah, this is a lot of money, but this is going to completely change how we operate. And it's going to put our whole operation under a lot of risk if they decide to cancel, you know, these big departures. And I'm like, you're totally right. You know, this isn't what you do. You don't deal with big tour groups. This is not your, your MO. Thank you for bringing me, grounding me again, you know, and, uh, you know, so seeing you turn away business, I love seeing that because we stick to, this is what we do and this is what we're good at, but we're not going to turn into something else just to, you know, satisfy the demands of something. So thanks for talking yeah, about the, the it's, pricing. It's really hard because I think that what you see with a lot of cruises is that is, is business and is volume and they need it and they can, uh, for us, it is business of course, but it's, uh, our own ethics and lifestyle choices that are tra that transpire through how we do things at the camp and it's it's a hard choice it's really hard because like you say you lose business but you, you do have to stick to your guns you know yeah absolutely um all right great so we're exactly on an hour here um oh, wow. we'll hang out and chat i'll hang out and chat all day if you want um <laughs> until i hear my kids uh, you know powering up the power tools outside um chelsea thank you so much love the way too you work together lots of love from outside go we love you guys outside go you've been one of our best supporters love you all lila love you so much thanks for coming in you need to hang out with stephanie you two would get along like a house on fire for sure share a lot of the same values um so let's see um and again i'll follow up with this and i'm also going to copy stephanie so you have her direct um you know, email and uh, yeah, we're a small operation and um, reach out anytime and we will let you guys know as soon as we know anything about opening dates and what it's going to look like there. Um, we'll do it. Thank you so much, Katie, for your feedback as well. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Clark, you're the best. You're the coolest. I love you. <laughs> no, you're the best. You're the best. I had to read you a love letter in the beginning. Clark, Clark's fun club. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, cool. All right, I'm gonna close this out. And make sure my kids okay. are still alive. Like uh, who knows what they're doing? A million names. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Bye, bye, everybody. Okay. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. You close it, Clark? Yeah, I'm closing it. Okay. Ciao. We'll chat later. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend. Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Okay. Don't go. <laughs>